Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Erin Lawrence, <coughs> and I am a festival volunteer. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Tennessee Williams Literary Festival Masterclass Series. We would like to thank <coughs> the Historic New Orleans Collections for providing this beautiful venue. And we do ask that you please leave all food and beverages outside, turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices. Today I'm delighted to introduce you to our presenters for this master class, which is Between Piety and Desire. <clears throat> our first presenter, Allison Also, is a New Orleans Writers Workshop co-founder. She has won many awards for her writing, <clears throat> including being selected for the 2014 O'Henry Prize. And her book on food and cocktail writing is The French Quarter Drinking Companion, A Guide to Bars in America's Most Eclectic Neighborhood. Yeah. Our second presenter and New Orleans Writer Workshop co-founder, Tom Andes, has had works appear in many locations, including Best Mystery Stories of 2012, Guernica, and Xavier Review. Uh, he lives in New Orleans, where he is a freelance writer and editor, but also moonlights as a country singer. <laughs> and finally, our third presenter, Jessica Kinnison, uh, has also had numerous publications, including in the Southern Humanities Review. She served as a Kenyan Review Fellow in 2018. She was nominated for a Pushcart Prize, and she teaches creative writing in the New Orleans Writers Workshop and co-produces the Dogfish Reading Series. So thank you all for coming, and we look forward to a great presentation. All right. So uh, thank you for those, uh, a special thank you for those who were, um, for the panel we just finished on Dialogue. Thank you for staying for this second panel. Uh, about setting and specifically how to write about New Orleans in a way that feels fresh and new. I uh, just want to let you know that the New Orleans Writers Workshop, we teach affordable community-based classes in creative writing here in New Orleans in fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and cross-genre. We offer these classes year-round. If you're interested in that, please come and see us um, after this session. We also offer individual mentoring and manuscript consultation. Even if you are not here and living in, um, in New Orleans, we can do that from afar as well. We'd love to talk to you more about that. Again, if you're interested, please come up and see us. Um, so it's not so easy to write convincingly about New Orleans precisely because it's written about so very much. There is a tremendous amount of myth and cliche, and New Orleans is one of those cities that it can feel difficult to find something that feels new, original, fresh, and true to the city. The city is also incredibly dynamic and complex, so rendering it justice can be difficult in and of itself. But today we want to tackle that question, how to write convincingly about settings, particularly in New Orleans, but in the larger sense about any setting that you think has been written about quite a lot. It could be that you're coming from a very different place than New Orleans and are interested in the larger question of how to write convincingly about the setting where you come from or the setting where your story or novel takes place or even a poem, right? But that's really our aim today, is talking writer to writer about the craft of establishing interesting and compelling settings. Not to use them just as a neutral backdrop, but as a real strength, almost a character, if you will, in your own piece of writing. One particular point I want to bring up is, right from the get-go, is that the setting is never a neutral character in the piece of writing that you are offering up. Setting is never neutral or just a backdrop but a dynamic and interactive force in your stories and in your work that can underscore character, heighten conflict, and help to reveal the larger point or theme of what it is that you want to bring across. I'd like to begin with just a, an example that some of us may know and that speaks to the day. I was thinking of Tennessee Williams himself. How many of you have ever either read 
or seen a movie version or a play version of A Streetcar Named Desire? <laughs> Great. <laughs> 100%. So much is talked about when you talk about the themes of A Streetcar Named Desire, and I know this because I used to teach at the University of New Orleans and I taught this play for quite a few years. So you're probably familiar with a lot of these themes, gender roles, power, the old South, the new South, differences of class, love, desire, death, right? But once I stopped teaching that as an academic person, and I really took a look at that play as a writer, the thing that struck me so much about what Williams did was his choice of setting. Of course, as a playwright, setting is critical because you are limited by what can be produced on the stage. And you have to make those settings count because you can't constantly be changing sets, right? So you've really got to make that setting work. If you really think about Streetcar Named Desire, we know it takes place in New Orleans, but where specifically does it take place? Bywater. And where in the bywater? Bring it down. Where? And what are we seeing on the stage? What is the actual setting, right? It's in the bywater. We don't know exactly what street, but I'm not asking for it. What is the container, if you will? And what kind of house? Correct, right? So now we're getting really into the specifics of setting here. Is it a big house? It is a second story and small. It is a two room shotgun, right, apartment. This choice that Williams has made is brilliant, right? Think about what happens. We have Blanche enters into a two, run, a two room shotgun apartment with, right, Stella and Stanley. Does streetcar named Desire work? in a sprawling Mississippi mansion where both Blanche and Stella are from. Does it work? Yeah. No, <laughs> right? This is about taking a container that was meant for two, introducing a third person into it, into that setting, add some alcohol, and watch it explode, yeah. right? <laughs> setting is critical. Streetcar named Desire doesn't work in a different setting. And if you go back and think about the play, right, you will see a series of trespasses and encroachments and fights for territory of those two rooms in scene after scene after scene, right? It's Blanche trying to carve herself out a little bit of privacy. Where? In the front room. Can she? No, <laughs> because there is no private space in that public room. And when she can't find it there, where does she go? Where we all go, to the bathroom, right? <laughs> and shuts the door, and who doesn't like it, and who bangs on the door, right? Get out, get out. It's Stanley fighting for that space right? The famous poker scene that takes place in the front room, right? Blanche would like to have that as her own space, but Stanley is reappropriating that space and saying, no, my turf, my territory here, right? And that famous cry of Stella, right, happens after the battle for the space in that public space. It's not just about who gets the front room, who gets the bedroom, who gets the bathroom. It's who controls the space ultimately gets the big prize, which is Stella herself. But that play works through setting and increasingly tension that comes through that setting as people attempt to carve out space. That's the real power of what setting can do for your writing when it is not neutral, but it becomes a terrain, right, that interacts with the character and shows that shifting dynamic of power, right? 
So I'm just bringing up this example just to say this is the kind of thing that we can all strive for in our writing when we're thinking about setting as being more than just a backdrop. We have two goals for today. It's to talk about setting, think about strategies and criteria, the craft of creating setting as a writer. And then our second goal, our second objective, is to get ourselves writing a scene in which setting plays a crucial role and is no longer just a backdrop or neutral, but helps to actually create change and shift within the character. So Tennessee Williams said, my places were emotional primarily. I, wrote, I write of locales in which I had lived or which I imagine I could live, but the topography was primal and sexual and terminal. It bore no distinct architecture or design or dialect, but on Royal Street, the one we're on, and Coliseum and Vista, streets I cannot relinquish, I found my places and dreamed a narrative, right? So just what Allison was saying, the place is part of the narrative, but the people are what matter, right? So as we move forward with our workshop, uh, we're gonna create a scene, as Allison said, and the guiding principles for that scene are specific concrete details, right? Like the soap and the water from the street cleaners as I was biking here, right? Um, what people wear, what we're all wearing right now as we look around. The Coke bottles on the bottom of the, the boy's shoes who's tap dancing nearby. All that specific concrete details, not what we imagine the setting to be, not what we've been told, not what we saw in a movie, but what we actually see, what they actually are, specific concrete details. The other thing is we want to foreground people, right? We want people to be the center of the story, just like, like Blanche and Stanley, and just, just like all of what Allison was just saying. People being people, doing specific things, wearing specific things, interacting in specific ways, with specific to them, not specific to the idea of someone who lives in New Orleans, or the idea of desire, or whatever, or, or us. The idea that specific to the characters we are trying to create and impart. Um, and I think the important thing for that is show them wanting things. You know, what do they feel? Just like Tennessee Williams said, my places were emotional primarily. The people, the people want things. They're doing things, they're living, right? Specific people, real people with real problems, as Allison says. Okay, so guiding principles, specific concrete details, people being people doing specific things and illustrating what those people want, right? And the setting can only help you with that, right? Uh, but you wanna foreground the people. Remember to do that as we move forward. Okay. Um, so we're gonna start, I'm gonna do some kind of brainstorming or like free writing to get you all started on another little exercise. I wanna read something uh, though. I have a terrible confession to make which is that I've never read Madame Bovary. I read a sentimental education, and honestly, I think I've, I've never, maybe it's the translation, I just, uh, Flaubert, I always found really boring, but I really do like Guy de Maupassant, who I did not, was a short story writer, and who was one of Flaubert's students, and this is from, um, this is a, so this is a piece of advice that Flaubert supposedly gave Maupassant, but this is, uh, it's Maupassant kind of reporting it, so I don't know how much this has sort of been editorialized, but he would say, when you pass a grocer sitting in front of his door, a concierge smoking his pipe or a cab rank, show me that grocer, that concierge, their attitude, their physical appearance, and by the skill of the picture you draw of them, their whole moral nature as well. And do this in such a way that I cannot confuse them with any other grocer or concierge, and with a single word, show me how one cab horse is different from the 50 others ahead of or behind it. And he would apparently set this as like an exercise for Maupassant. He would have him go out and sit and observe things and like make notes and watch things and make stories out of his observations, which is always really interesting to me because it had never occurred to me. Like when I first read that, I was like, well, how would you make stories out of your observations of just of the world? And that seemed like a very foreign thing to me. Um, 
as far as so as far as place goes, I will say this: when I moved here uh, for the first time in 1997, I'm not from here, and I was reading. How many of you all have read Confederacy of Dunces? I mean, you know, that book. The, it, the, it, the people in that book would have seemed like a caricature to me, except I was staying at the YMCA, which is no longer up there up on Tivoli, uh, what people call Lee Circle, and I would walk around the French Quarter at night, and I was like, I walked past like probably 50 guys like the dude in that book every night, and I was like, oh, like this is not just a caricature, like this person, like these people exist. Um, so, uh, my point in saying that I think is that sometimes those details, like the, these like larger than life, I think New Orleans can be like a larger than life place. Um, and it has like a very, very big sort of exceptional sense of itself. But I think that writing about here is the same as writing about anywhere else. And so far as like, it has to be based on sort of like you want to foreground like your own like original observations of the place. So what I want to get you all doing uh, just sort of, for sort of brainstorming um, is I would like you to make a list of just 10 details. These are just 10 things you can just, these would be 10 things maybe that you remember just from your morning. Like what are 10 things, observations you've made this morning, but think specific sense, sense details. It can be a smell, it can be a sight, it can be a sensation, but what are, it can be a person you passed on the street. 10 specific, make them as specific as possible. 10 observations just from your morning, just getting here. Does everybody have a notebook and a pen? Raise your hand if you need one. All right, gotcha. Yeah. Remember, these can be any kinds of details, are details, architectural details, uh, something about the, the weather. Just try to make them as specific as possible. And for now, and don't, don't, don't censor yourself either. Just put down whatever you kind of, whatever you feel like you remember observing from this morning. There's not like a right or a wrong.
And aim for 10. And if you come up a little short, that's okay. And if you go over, that's okay too. 12 is fine. 14 is fine. <laughs> I'm going to start talking again, but y'all can keep keep listing if you're if you're still listing. Um, <laughs> not listing like a ship lists doesn't that mean to fall to the side, but writing, making your lists. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, what do I want to say? Okay, so. What are I think I had the best way to approach this. I can write them down if you want. That? You can write them down. No, that's all right. That's all right. We'll, just, we'll just shout them out. But okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that um, one of the things about this, actually, writing about place or any place that I think is interesting is, um, is uh, you know, like I said, I moved here a long time ago. Do, do, y'all, do y'all know the writer Andre Debuse? It's a short story writer, and his his son wrote Andre Debus the Third wrote House of Sand and Fog, which is a really terrific novel, a fabulous book. His father was a guy from Lake Charles, and he lived all his life though in Southern New Hampshire in Northern Massachusetts, which is where I grew up. And he um, somebody asked him once how a Louisiana boy uh, felt being in the in the North, and he said something like he's like well he's like I, he's like New Hampshire is the most redneck state north of the Mason Dixon line so I feel right at home. I always thought that was very funny and I wondered if that explained like my reverse affinity um, for Louisiana. My point in saying that is I think there are a lot of cliches about places and a lot of times with the cliches about places, New Orleans, there's a lot of cliches about New Orleans and somehow when you're writing about a place, sometimes you want to acknowledge those things. Like one of the vi- vividest memories I have of walking here this morning is walking up Royal Street and seeing two of those horrible day glow green cups that hand grenades come in, you know, those those things just like tipped over next to each other, next to like a fence. And I was like, there's a story that goes there. It's probably somebody's really horrible night and painful morning, you know. And yet those cups are the most, I think, some of the most cliched things about New Orleans, you know, oh, keg cups and Mardi Gras. So like, I'm curious, like, what are the, what are the cliches about New Orleans or what are the things that you all just shout them out? What are the things that you feel like you're like, oh God, I can't stand. I don't want to ever read another New Orleans story about X, Y, or Z, what are some of the things that you feel like? Mardi Gras parades, beignets, beignets. beads beads, beads hanging in trees, beads, the tux toilet paper hanging off of trees, anything else? Beignets in the morning, what else? Anything else? What's that? Katrina. Katrina, Katrina, yeah, okay. Three performers, okay. But you notice a lot of those things, though, too, are things that you can write into um, in an interesting way also. Like, there's a truth, I think, in a lot of those things to be told about something, which is what uh, I want to sort of get at with this. So um, anything else? Yeah, the board. Tourists? Yeah, yeah. Well, it becomes, like, very mixed. And it's like com- complaining the tourist, but then complaining about the tourist becomes a stereotype <laughs> about, about the tourist. Um, Psychics in Jackson Square. We live, there's like 500 and some odd festivals in South Louisiana every year. Do y'all know that? We were laughing about planning this though because we were like, all right, well, we don't want to have like a, a, like a, you know, like a cliche of New Orleans is like going to music festivals and eating like shrimp po' boys. And then I was kind of like, but I actually like a sp- spending a lot of my time doing that, I think <laughs> is what I, was, what I was getting at. So I think that... Um, I think that there is a way in which there's sometimes a truth to those things or about the larger than life aspects of our experience here that you want to honor and, and be true to as well is, is my point in saying that. So, um, anything else? That's good. That's a good, or, the, the danger and the, and the, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like nightlife. It's almost like it's, it's, it's portrayed as a dangerous city very often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and especially on television, I think. Yeah. You know, that, that there's something always unseemly and, and always intoxicating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think we have a challenge. I mean, I think one of the challenges writers is to write into, like, the ways in which that's not true. I mean, this is also, uh, you know, um, is to write against those things because those are, like, also, like, really damaging cliches and really damaging stereotypes about the place. And I think they, um, and, and they justify a lot of the sort of, I think people have a lot of very pejorative attitudes about life here. Um, yeah, so um, I think I'm going to turn it over to who's next. Jessica. All right. hey. Okay, guys. Um, so we've done some brainstorming. Now I want to give you the premise of our scene. Okay. So I'm gonna do my best to talk slowly. I'd like you to write down the gist. You know, and I'll read it twice. Your character is chewing on something that's happened to them in the recent past. Okay. So it's turning over in their minds something that's happened in the recent past. Could be a charged encounter a decision that has to be made, something like that, something that eats away at you, keeps you up at night kind of thing, right? And that's your choice. Uh, and while your character is chewing on that, they go out to perform a mundane task in New Orleans. For example, go get beignets, or, which I also like to do, uh, or um, go to the corner store because they forgot their toothbrush, or, um, take a walk on the river, you know, whatever. Uh, in the course of completing or not completing this task, they have an encounter with someone from the environment who causes them to experience a shift in understanding as a result of this encounter, right? So they, they run into somebody that shifts their perspective. All right? Their perspective, yeah. Good, good point. Their perspective on what it is that they're chewing over, right? Or chewing on, mulling over. <laughs> okay? All right. So, your character is chewing on something that's happened to them in the recent past. It could be a charged encounter, a decision that has to be made, or something along those lines. They go out to perform a mundane task in New Orleans. In the course of completing or not completing that task, they have an encounter with someone from this environment who causes them to experience a shift in understanding about whatever it is that's eaten away at them, right? That, that's recently happened to them. All right, and then this is how we relate it back to Tom. Along the way, you should use those 10 details from your observation to develop the scene and encounter. Tricky, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Does that make sense? So basic parts, something just happened to them in the recent past that's, that's bugging them and they have to, to figure it out. They go out to perform a mundane task in New Orleans, they run into somebody that shifts their perspective. All right? Along the way, you're using those 10 observations. Y'all ready? So now we got some pre-writing. So you can do this, I like to list this just so it's not, you don't have to think about it too much. Don't edit, don't, don't, you know, revise yourself along the way. Just, just put down what comes to mind, all right? So we're writing, we're starting to pre-write for our scene. What's the character's relationship to the city? Are they new? Have they been here a long time? Or somewhere in between? All right, second, choose the specific setting within the city where this will happen, right? Where are they going out to perform this task? All right, what is the thing that is being mulled over? What is the decision or conflict that is bothering them? Something recent, significant, and something they can't ignore, right? Those things that wake you up at three in the morning kind of things, right? Lastly, what causes them to be on the move? What is the task at hand? So what's the mundane task at hand? Yeah, so 
what, what causes them to actually literally move down the street toward something? What's the task they're going to achieve, right? Yeah, why they leave the house, why they leave the hotel, why they leave the writing workshop, whatever. Um, you they, know, like that toothbrush, left the toothbrush idea, right? You got to go get something. They got to find an all-night grocery. They got to, yeah. yeah. Go to the bank. Mm-hmm. Buy pick tickets the, for something. Pick up the dry cleaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's the character's relationship with the city? What's the setting? What's the thing that's being mulled over? What causes them to be on the move? What is the task at hand that they either achieve or don't achieve? And if you've only been in the city for 12 hours, okay, which that might apply to some of you, take the setting that you're already starting to observe. Take the French Quarter as your setting. Okay, <laughs> so the idea is you've just given yourself some really basic parameters here. And we're gonna move into the actual writing of the scene. Again, these are choices that you can go back and later revise. For our purposes here, we're just making quick choices so we can plug these things in and get to how we can create a scene, right, around setting. So don't feel, if you feel like, oh, I'm not so sure about this, that's okay. It's, it would be normal to feel that way, but we just need to make some quick choices for the purposes of getting ourselves started. But I wanted to say just a couple things before we begin actually writing the scene, which is, again, writer to writer here. The process that we're showing you of pre-writing and giving yourself a few basic parameters is something that you can easily reproduce on your own. Sometimes we give ourselves a tremendous amount of pressure to start writing a scene as if we have to begin with line one. We can take a little bit of baby steps in pre-writing, so just kind of keep that, and I hope that's one takeaway um, you take away from this panel today. Um, this is something that you can do on your own, one question at a time. The other thing is this, even if you are new to New Orleans, you may be thinking, how could I possibly write convincingly about New Orleans? How could I suddenly become the expert? You don't need to be the expert on New Orleans to write convincingly about New Orleans as a setting. You are the expert of your own observations and you are the expert of your character. Even Tennessee Williams who lived here in this city and knew it intimately didn't show you everything about Streetcar Named Desire. He chose a detail, the New Orleans shotgun as a setting, right? Took something that felt real and true and he exploited it to the max. So that's really what we're looking for today, to take the details that you know and the character that you are about to create and to use that interaction between character and setting to create something that feels fresh. That is true for New Orleans, it is true for any setting that you write. Let's go ahead and move ourselves into the actual writing of the scene. We're going to get your character moving, in motion, moving from place A to place B, which is the real heart of your setting. They're in search of something, a mundane task, a chore, a little responsibility, someone or someplace they have to go, to do, where are they? Where are they headed?
And I'm going to give you little nudges and then some blank space for writing. We'll give you more nudges and help you along the scene. This is a guided writing exercise. You do not need to be perfect. Think about tone, the emotion. How are they feeling right now? Hurried? Are they anxious? Focused? They're still moving through the setting. They're picking out a detail. It might be one of the 10 you already wrote down. They're not going to see everything around them. But because they are an emotional person, they will pick out certain details in their environment. What will they see because of how he or she is feeling? What will catch their attention? What will their eyes lock on? Now we're going to use the external world, the setting, to tap into what they're really thinking about, the real issue, not the mundane task that's on the surface of what they're in search of, but the real stuff, the problem. Use that setting to tap into it. How might something that they see in their external world, their setting, be the trigger, or the reminder, or the segue for your character to dig deep and to let us know what is on his or her mind, the real problem. Let the outside world be the segue to get us into the interiority and the real issue of what they're thinking about.
I'm going to talk a little bit, but y'all keep writing. This is not meant to take you out of what you're doing. This is just background noise. Programming running in the background. So your focal character might be alone. They might be with someone. But as they go out in the world, they're going to encounter people. They're going to encounter things. So at some point, they need to have some kind of encounter that jars them a little bit or shakes them up. And because this is going to be based, what you're writing is going to be based in your in character, whatever they run into or they encounter that shakes them up needs to touch on this thing that they've been agonizing about, this thing that keeps them up late at night, this problem that they're trying to figure out that's sort of running in the background, but it's also going to become foregrounded by the stuff they encounter in the world. And you can look back at your list of observations and your list of details to try to help get that into the story. But also think as your character has this encounter, this encounter that's going to sort of jar them or shake them up. Also think about if that, this encounter this with a person, you can write against type. You can write against what this person they might encounter first seems like they might be. They might look one way, but they might talk or act a different way.
depending on whether you believe there are five or six senses, try to engage all five or six senses in what you're writing. Look back through it. Maybe you haven't yet engaged like a sense of smell. Maybe you haven't yet engaged. Uh, uh, visual is what we have the, I think the most ready access to, right? But think about what, have you not used one of your, one of the senses in this? Go back and try to make sure, or don't go back, but as you're going forward, if you haven't used one or more of the senses, try to incorporate that. And again, you can pull it from the observations you've made and that list you've made, or if you associate from that list. Um, there's a historical, I don't think she's mainly a historical writer, but uh, I saw a writer of historical fiction speak many, many years ago, and she was talking about how she did exhaustive research into like the early 20th century, but it was always about picking the two or three details out of all that research, two or three details was always only, that was all she needed to make a scene, right? So. You don't have to be exhaustive about cataloging everything you see, just picking like the one or two details that put your character in that place and illustrate what's happening. And as we move toward a close with our scene, again, this doesn't have to be perfect. This doesn't have to be the way your scene stays. We're just practicing the parts, right? Um, getting it down. I want you to think about how the setting um, and the environment might inform the way the character feels now, right? I'd like you to illustrate something from the setting or environment that you see a shift in the environment, you see a shift in the character, right? So your final lines will be something showing a shift in the environment, a shift in the character. Um, so an image, right? I was trying to think of one and uh, on one of the Mardi Gras days of parades, I uh, went to the parade I like by the river, but it was freezing cold. I mean, for us, I mean, it was like uh, 30 degrees or something, and I had a screen over my eyes that was uh, making it hard to see, and I just thought, what am I doing here? This is nuts in this crazy costume, and it's cold, and you know, this is a bad idea, and what am I doing with my life anyway? You know, what are those moments? And um, right then, a barge went along the river that was called the Wisdom Line, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's as simple as that, right? And of course, it could be silly to put that in a story, but if you build to it, it'll have impact. Does that make sense? An image could really pack a punch at the end. 
uh, and show the internal shift in your character through the setting. And, and then again, you're using your setting to promote your people, right? And show your people's feelings, okay? So take a few minutes to give that a shot. Um, you know, your own wisdom line. And again, we're kind of winding down our scene now. The character has shifted. Now the environment is shifting along with our person because our people are the most important. One more minute. Go ahead and finish up that last line for now.
All right. <laughs> it's wonderful to see that some people are still uh, attempting to scribble or punch the keys. It's great to see that uh, productivity. Uh, just wanted to get a, a show of hands. How many of you were able to set your scene in a specific location in New Orleans? Great. <laughs> How many of you were able to deduce the overarching or big problem that your character was facing? Yes, I'm. Awesome. Excellent. And how many of you were able to incorporate at least a few of those observational details from your list? Awesome. <laughs> You all have been writing under what is probably some of, uh, aside from the fact that this room is gorgeous and makes uh, all of us feel fantastic, okay? But aside from that, all of you are writing under pretty tough circumstances, right? None of, none of this is, is ideal, and yet all of you were able to tap into something there and produce work. I just wanna give everyone a round of applause for that. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to kind of bring this back into some takeaways from today's presentation, give you a list of those, again, writer to writer in terms of thinking about setting. After that, we're gonna leave a few minutes to hear just a taste from a few of you of the scenes uh, that you were writing and we'll hopefully leave a couple of minutes also for some questions. Um, but when I'm thinking about the takeaways as a writer, things that I can actually apply as a writer to my work about setting, here we go. Number one, you do not need to be an expert on a place in order to convincingly write about it. Why? What you need is observation, and you are the expert of your own observations. Observation is your number one friend in writing about setting. And using your observations, try and tap into all five of your senses. Number two, in order to achieve verisimilitude, which is a fancy word, <laughs> I can say and I'm not sure I can spell. But in order to get verisimilitude, think about the example of Tennessee Williams. He did not show you all of New Orleans, but he did show you something that was a detail, the shotgun apartment that felt true to the city. So find a few telling details, ones that feel true and authentic, and use those, right? You don't have to include everything, but just a few convincing ones. Number three, remember that when you are writing about setting, it is really in the service of the character. The character is what matters. Otherwise, we do fall into cliche where we feel as though people are props in front of an already pre-established backdrop. Instead, foreground your character and remember it's the relationship between your character and the setting your character's conflict and the setting. And that's when you're just gonna get into the real, the stuff that feels real and true. Right? Number four, no setting is ever neutral. Settings can work in conjunction with or against your character, but they are never neutral backdrops. There is always a relationship between your character in his or her environment. It is just not a flat screen in the back. Number five, no setting is ever static. It changes. What your character picks out in the setting, what he or she observes, how they move through the setting, means that the setting is never again flat and static, but is ever evolving. That setting that might have been your character's friend in the beginning of the scene may not be by the end, and vice versa. The setting that they thought they knew or was, there, was uh, antagonistic in the beginning could end up becoming a friend, right? So that changes how your character feels about it and how the, and the setting is, is also ever evolving. Number six, cliche. It's there. If you feel as though you must use the cliche, find a way to upturn it 
and make it unpredictable. You might have to write about Mardi Gras. You might have to write about right, the gypsies or the, the fortune tellers in Jackson Square, right? You might have to write about Katrina, but try to find the way in which it feels true to your character, right, and moves beyond just a backdrop to overturn that cliche and make it um, different or fresh. Be conscious of the cliche, in other words, don't play to it. Number seven, aim in a scene where setting is critical for this balance between the external world of the setting itself, those physical details, what the setting is, the external world, and the internal world or landscape of your character. The external landscape and the physical concrete world and the internal terrain or landscape of your character's thoughts, emotions, in and out, in and out. That creates a balance and a dynamic in your scene and on the page. And number eight, do yourself a favor. Give yourself a gift. Think about setting your character in motion, just as we did with a particular task or a chore. Something that is on the surface level that sets them in motion, gives them a purpose, and sends them into motion in a setting. Something they're trying to accomplish. Chances are, this isn't really what's at stake. Chances are, this isn't the big deal. But it gives you, as a writer, right, the reason to set them in motion and to put them going through that scene, right, through that setting and observing details. Again, it also creates another dynamic. What's on the surface, what they're seemingly trying to do, and then use that as a way to get to what's really going on. Okay. I want to hear from you all a little bit. And I just want to see if anyone wants to volunteer to read just a few sentences or a paragraph. Um, and I'd like to hear if anybody wants to read like a selection where we can hear you using one of the, one of the details from your observation um, in what you've written. Is anybody who wants to read? Any volunteers? All right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the, always the challenge. <laughs> Is this the place for me? In 24 hours, the streets seem more self-conscious than any place I've ever lived since New York. I have to sign a lease. I cannot now feel fully sure I want to place the signature. Around me are deliberate paths, deliberate views. Hipsters so convinced of their uniqueness that they fail to see that they are as like as their Brooklyn brothers. Tame and homogenous. As the men of Wall Street with their strangled collars wrapped up in a twist of expensive silk. The tourists, too, wan and pale, the sad, untucked, riotous shirt proclaiming frivolity, cigars, martini glasses, dancing crayfish. Sidestepping the upturned sign in the watered swill of the street with the hand chalked words, I drink to make people look better. Even the street people are the same. Why swallow the consensus of whatever agreed upon tacos produces pennies from the passerby? They say the same things here as they do in New York, watching me narrowly through the same jaundiced eyes, beckoning for the same hands covered with jagged jailhouse tattoos. I've come here to find something different, but I find the same, both foreign and perfectly recognizable, all of the same. When I, when I hear that piece, I see a lot of um, the things that we've asked for in motion there. You've got a tremendous amount of sensory detail. You are honing into different types of sensory detail. And this idea of here is the cliche and you are overturning that cliche. In other words, the piece is really about cliche, but you're calling attention to it and you're questioning that cliche, right? You're calling it to account. Really great ideas there. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Let's give maybe one more. Does anyone else want to read just a selection? It can be a couple sentences, a paragraph. Okay. All right. mm -hmm. uh, it's in an evil ride. Yeah, great. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. In, in motion. Yes. 
all the details of each one and then tell them which one are each of the draft story. That's how it ends, it's in two minutes. Um, I have to tell you, we just need you to go right into it. Okay, okay. <laughs> but it, focus on the GPS. <coughs> the GPS being arrived. He pulls up to the curb in front of the Orient Hotel. He holds out a hand to assist me up onto the curb. The hand rests slightly longer in line than normal. And he says, Now you have your day, now you put your day to the fullest. Do you hear a lot of people lady? Yes, sir, gentlemen, Sam. Yes, sir, I will. The risk of having the surgery fell away right then. I will call my doctor with my decision in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. I like the way that you are using, or I admire the way that you are using a very small human interaction to make your character feel more comfortable, more taken care of, more secure. I think you really have the start of something there. And as the, as the listener, I think you might have the start of a, of, a, of a beginning of a larger piece there, something that you can work forward. Uh, let's see. We've got about five minutes left. We were just wondering if you guys had any questions for us, either about the New Orleans Writers Workshop, about setting, about writing in general, anything. But anything we uh, anything, we've anything talked we talked about, about so far? Yeah. 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 Uh, does the New Orleans Writers Workshop have a website? We do. What, what is that? We do. It is uh, www.neworleansriders.com. Are we sending around the notebook? Okay, so she asked if we have a website for the New Orleans Writers Workshop. Um, we do. I've got some uh, stickers here with our website on it. I also have business cards. And then we're sending around a notebook. Um, so, oh, keep going. Yes, please. No. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, great. No. Oh. Oh. No, it just oh, yeah. Keep going. If you it must have just come across the aisle. Thank you. <laughs> just go ahead. Oh goodness, it got stuck in the the, the world. No problem. Don't feel any obligation to put your information on there, but if you want to be contacted by us and learn more, I'd be happy to send you some more info. It yeah. will not be sold. If we at all. Before, right, I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rosary. I would say that setting becomes really critical in the opening of any work and it doesn't matter if it is the opening of a chapter of a story of a scene your reader will thank you for being oriented and situated in those opening lines right we don't want our readers or our audience guessing guessing where this is taking place or being distracted because they don't know where they are in that sense setting right, is a, a really primary function of what you write. The question then becomes, in those opening lines, how can you very quickly, without dropping in a big brick of information, which would be my no-no, right, mm -hmm. how can you, in just a few details, establish and orient your reader of where they are, knowing that more great details are to come? And if your character is moving through a setting, then that always gives you the opportunity to keep adding textural details, right? But even if your character is stagnant, sitting at a table, sitting in a chair, right? There's still a level of observation that continues to be unfolding, right? There's still a way that you can make sure that that setting never becomes static or your character's relationship to it is static. But I would say, A, what you wanna do, Situate your reader quickly. Use a few thumbnail sketch details to give us a visual and bring us into that place, but avoid giving us too much information that slows the momentum of the scene and prevents it from starting. 
So just so you all know, the, the question was, uh, as writers, what do we think is most important to include in the first few lines of a, of a piece of work? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would just say, uh, oh, I mean, I think I was saying in the last uh, workshop, just, I mean, I, I really kind of come to believe that in a story, like having, having some kind of like inciting incident or something that makes clear um, just something just uh, something bad needs to happen I guess like you want something you want something to happen in the first I, I would say like in the first sentence or the first paragraph just something that, and I but I think specific information so you know where you are so you know where you are so you know who the point of view character is so you know what point of view the story is in that's all really important but I think something that creates a sense of like something being at stake or something being at risk for the character um, so that we know like from like the beginning of a story that there's like a reason that we're going to hear the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of convincing in 2019, I think, and maybe any time, but particularly now with so much information coming at us, to convince anybody to read your work. You know, even for me, I love to read. I'm a writer, and it's like I have to be convinced in the first line or else I'm not going to continue reading. And maybe that's from a long time of teaching and uh reading literary journals, you know, submissions, but those first few lines are critical. Like they're saying, you have to know what the world is and how it works, or else you're like, I don't know how this works, and I don't believe in it, I'm not gonna read. You have to know what's at stake, what matters, why it matters. And then for me, I would say starting in the middle of the action is is something I really admire in the, the, the novels and short stories that I wanna emulate and something I try to do in my own work. In, in media race, right? You start in the middle of the action, you're thrown into a, this world, you know what the rules of the world are, and you know why this person is dr driven forward, what's driving them, what's their, their trouble, right? And so you're, you're there, you're there with them, and it's not reading a piece of writing, it's entering a world and, and going there, right? Which is why I think we all wanna read and write. Um, you know, to understand what it's like to be another human being and be outside of ourselves and be in the story, right? So th I think that's critical to making the piece, not writing something written, but making it a story you can be a part of as the reader. So starting in the middle of the action is what I think is most important. That is such a great idea. Um, I can think of a really practical example because I, I read a fair amount from teaching of, uh, of work as well. Mm -hmm. And there's almost this idea that we have to see the action from the very get-go. If your character, for instance, is driving to go on a task, we don't have to watch them actually take the keys, open up the car door, start up the engine, right? That's not necessarily where the action begins. Right. We can, with the magic of writing and a double break or beginning a chapter, right? Guess what? They're already in the car. They're already on route. They're already halfway to their destination. I just think that's such a great, great thing to keep in mind, Jessica. Yeah, and making some choices, right? Make a choice not to include the, the, car, the car key going into the ignition and turning, right? You wanna be going down the street and getting there. And something connected to that should be important, right? Yeah, but at the same time, you don't want us to wonder how the person got there, you know? So it's a balancing act. I mean, you mean like moving through different like psychological settings or moving through different physical yeah. settings different that affect, places. yeah. Uh, okay, so with this class, it's about setting. Yes. Yeah. So, but if your story's about, mostly about the place inside, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think it, 
I think it depends a little bit on 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 who you ex want your audience to be and what your relationship with them is going to be. Because I think that, um, I mean, I think you you know, I mean, what the what's the Kafka story where he turns into the cockroach? How do I right. metamorphosis? <laughs> it all happens in the dude's bedroom, basically. You know, um, Kafka maybe isn't for everybody. So you have, I mean, you know, I mean, I think you have, you have to, and I think the more psych, the more, the more sort of in, in internals, but you know, I, I just, I, I think that you have, you have, I, I think Eudora, does Eudora Welty, is it Eudora Welty who said nothing happens no place? Am I making that up? I think that's a good statement anyway. Like nothing happens no place. Like no matter you, you there's always going to be a relationship to time. Even if it's a fantasy, like I just read a terrific fantasy novel called The Fifth Season, which is like all happens in this imaginary world, right? But like it's in a place with like rules and the characters relate to each other in based on like kind of the ground rules that the writer created in that world. So I wouldn't say there's a wrong answer to that, I think it depends how much um, it depends how much you want to sort of break your characters out of that psychological space and have them sort of in real space. But I think that's to me, I would say that's the you want to have a balance between those things. You know, some psychological space, some real space, and so that we can kind of experience that back and forth. Does I, that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say just a quick kind of. There is no formula, but just remember this. When you shift between the exterior world to the internal world, the internal world to the external world, that shifting of gears creates interest for your reader. You hang out only describing the scenery, guess what, it flatlines. You hang out only describing the interior thoughts or emotions of your character, it flatlines. So give yourself that advantage and there is no formula for how often to shift or how long you can hang out in each one, but it is in fact the shifting between those two that you will create interest from your reader. She basically said what I was going to say. <laughs> also, I've read your work. I wouldn't worry about it, just keep at it. As long as the, the, as long as the reader feels like they have their own two feet on, in some place, they're rooted, and they're not just floating in the, out there in the ether, then you're good. Just, just keep two feet on the ground for your reader, and you're, I think you're, you're solid. All right. Um, okay, I see that folks are getting up and leaving. <laughs> so, I think we're out of time. We can't keep you we're out of time. time. Yeah, we want to keep you time. forever. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks, It was such a pleasure. Have a great Tennessee Williams Festival.